The author, Kate Bowler, writes that her great-grandmother, Marjorie Bevington, was a hell of a woman. She was tough and kind, made her family's meals and sewed all of their clothes and ran an entire block's worth of apartments. She was also a painter, sort of. Marjorie Bevington wasn't a very good painter, but Marjorie Bevington wasn't used to not being able to succeed at what she set her mind to. So one day she walked down to the local thrift store and bought a painting and painted over the artist's signature in the bottom corner and signed it herself. Hmm. Kate Bowler writes, I had that one hung in my house until I got old enough to think, wait a minute, she really made some remarkable progress. <laughs> my great grandmother, she continues, had bought into a story of intense perfectionism that she had to be everything or she was nothing at all. Last week in worship, we met another family with reason to believe that they can do anything and be everything. The amazing Madrigals of D Disney's latest hit movie, Encanto. We learned the story of Abuela, who as a young woman fled her home, lost her husband and received a miracle. The blessing of a magic house in a magic town surrounded by high mountains for protection, and a magic family in which each member in every generation has their own magical gift. Everyone that is, except for her granddaughter, Mirabelle. One of the members of the family, Madrigal, who we met last week, is Mirabelle's sister, Louisa. Louisa has the power of superhuman strength, and she looks the part. Right, if you, if you know the movie or if you could see her, she's this giant woman with huge muscles. We first encounter Louisa in the movie as the family is running around making last minute preparations for little Antonio's gift ceremony, which is about to take place that night. We see Louisa carrying huge barrels three at a time. If someone needs to move, to move a piano, she's on it. Guests need valet parking for their donkeys as they begin to show up. She'll pick up those donkeys, one in each arm, just like it's nothing, and get them where they need to go. Louisa is the strong one, inside and out. Now, as I mentioned last week, the family's magical gifts aren't just for fun. At the beginning of Antonio's gift ceremony, Abuela stands up and she makes a speech. 50 years ago, she says, in our darkest moment, this candle that she's holding blessed us with a miracle. And the greatest honor of our family has been to use our blessings to serve this beloved community. This isn't the first time in the movie that this idea has come up. Already in the movie's opening song, we hear Abuela singing, we swear to always help those around us and earn the miracle that somehow found us. Well, all seems to go according to plan that night as Antonio, the youngest of the Madrigals, receives his magical gift. But that night, as the town celebrates, Casita, the house, begins to crack and Mirabelle begins her mission to save the magic and her family. She begins the next morning with her cousin Dolores, who can hear anything. Dolores tells Mirabelle that she heard Luisa's eye twitching all night. When Mirabelle goes to Luisa, Luisa tries to play it off, but eventually she gives in and tells Mirabelle the truth. The night before, while Casita was cracking, Luisa felt weak. Now again, this isn't just a matter of disappointment. This is a full-blown existential crisis. These are the amazing Madrigals. And Luisa is the strong one. 
She has internalized abuela's expectations. She has a responsibility to her family and to her community. Who is she if she isn't the strong one anymore? What is she worth if she can no longer do what everyone expects of her? It seems to me that even though uh, the song We Don't Talk About Bruno is the runaway hit song from this movie, it's Luisa's song, Surface Pressure, that everyone I know seems to most identify with. Under the surface, Luisa sings, I'm pretty sure I'm worthless if I can't be of service. Who am I if I can't carry it all if I falter? No cracks, no breaks, no mistakes, no pressure. Have you ever felt like Louisa? Have you ever felt like you have to be what other people expect you to be? The perfect parent, the perfect child, the perfect employee, the perfect Christian, the person who somehow has it all together? Do you ever feel like you just might crack under the pressure? So many of us, it seems, are just going through life, trying to hold it all together. You know, for some of us, the, the world shut down two years ago and all of a sudden we were required to keep doing our full-time jobs, maybe with new skills required, while also suddenly homeschooling our kids. Others of us have felt the pressure of being part of the sandwich generation, caring for kids and parents with health issues at the same time. Just this week, I've read multiple articles of young student athletes who have died by suicide unable to live up to the pressure that they feel is put on them. And then meanwhile, our capitalist ideology tells us that if we're not stressed, we're not important. We're, we are only as good as the value we add to our company. We are worth what we can produce. And we make ourselves miserable just thinking that if only we can find the right diet or the right organizational system, if we can just find the secret to it all, that somehow we'll be okay. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel like you just might crack? If so, then I have a word for you from the letter to the Ephesians. The author of Ephesians who calls themselves Paul, but may or may not actually be Paul, is writing to churches in Asia Minor, telling these Gentile communities just how they fit into the story and community of salvation that has preceded them. And in chapter two, the author writes, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For those of you who, like me, spend a lot of time worrying about how you're measuring up and earning your right to belong, this is what God wants you to know. All the points you rack up and the awards you win and the hours you bill and the number of books you read with your kid before kindergarten aren't going to save you. Our worth, our belovedness, our place in God's story, those things are offered to us for free. And faith, I think, is not just being able to believe intellectually that Jesus died for me, but accepting this alternate reality that God offers us in Jesus, 
where no one has anything to prove. Now, because I know that this verse has been at the center of the whole faith versus works debate and discourse uh, in Christian conversation, um, the, the question of, well, okay, if we're saved by grace through faith, then basically, can we just be jerks and not worry about it? Let me call your attention to the next verse in this passage as well. For we are what God has made us created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. We go on to read in the rest of Ephesians that the way we live our lives in Christian community and outside of it matters. And that this is in fact a matter of some intentionality of working together and listening to the Holy Spirit but the thing is, it is easier to love when you know you're loved than when you know that you're required to love your neighbor X amount in order to make it into heaven. It's easier to live as God intended when we're not doing it for a grade. I've been seeing a spiritual director over the past couple months. And at our last meeting, I was talking to her about this voice in my head, and maybe you know it, that seems to always be asking if I've done enough, if I've made the faithful choice, if the thing that I want is really the thing that God wants for me. And she listened to all of this. And then she said, you know, I have to tell you, I don't think that voice is of God. And I said, how do I know? And she said, has that voice ever brought you peace? And I didn't have anything to say to that. Because yes, I believe that grace is supposed to challenge us. And yes, I believe that grace is supposed to be costly, but in the end, yes, it's also supposed to bring us peace and not just be one more thing that makes us think that we might crack. I think sometimes of the lyrics to a song that I really liked in college that I sometimes come back to when I just kind of feel like I have nothing left. If I stand, let me stand on the promise that you will pull me through. And if I can't, let me fall on the grace that first brought me to you. So what if you fall, Louisa? Go ahead and fall and let grace catch you. As it turns out, Louisa isn't the only member of the Madrigals who feels the pressure of trying to live up to her family name and her magical gift. Her sister, Isabella, who has the gift of making flowers bloom at will, feels the pressure to be perfect and beautiful and ladylike, to marry according to her family's expectations instead of what she actually wants. Issa, it turns out, would sometimes rather grow cactuses than roses. Mirabelle, our hero, who has no magical gift, feels the pressure of proving her worth in a family where everyone seems to be special but her. Bruno, the uncle no one talks about, even ran away when it seemed like his gift was doing more harm to his family than good. All of them thought that they had to earn a gift that they had already been given. And maybe sometimes we do too. At the end of Encanto, when the Madrigals gather back at their beloved casita, which has completely crumbled to the ground, and Bruno, 
shows up again. Abuela reveals the lesson that it took her this long to figure out. This miracle isn't something that has to be earned. The miracle is not some magic that you've got, she sings. The miracle is you, not some gift, just you. And then the Madrigals begin to rebuild together. With the magic extinguished, Louisa is perhaps only slightly stronger than the average person. But it doesn't matter. She's part of the family. She's loved. And she belongs. As Christians, we might put Abuela's words a little differently. The miracle is that we are made in the image of God, that we are loved, that Jesus lived, died, and rose again to offer us life both abundant and eternal. We couldn't earn it if we tried. All we have to do is by faith, live it. Amen.